Hey everyone and welcome back to Farming Fast and Slow with Adam Wolf. I am taking over today and we have a very special uh, guest on, Natasha Krell. And to introduce Natasha, Natasha is a PhD candidate in the Department of Geography at the University of California, Santa Barbara. She studies climate variability impacts on smallholder farmers and food security in East Africa. Her research couples data from IoT agro-meteorological sensors with household and SMS-based surveys to understand farmer decision-making in the southern province of Zambia and in central Kenya. She is also interested in information communication technologies, ICT, and climate services for smallholder farmers, and is looking at questions of how information disseminated through mobile phones can improve farmers' adaptive capacity. Natasha graduated from the College of the Atlantic in 2016 with a BA in Human Ecology, and she was awarded a Fulbright Fellowship to conduct her doctoral research in Kenya in 2018. So Natasha, with that, I'm going to turn it over to you to talk a little bit about how you got involved in agriculture before we pivot our discussion to focusing on smallholder farmers. Yeah, thank you so much, Jess, for that introduction and also for having me on Farming Fast and Slow. I just wanted to say I'm really happy to be here and it's awesome what you guys came up with in the title because for me it evokes you know farming fast this data acquisition real-time monitoring that we desperately need for you know solving um food sh food shortages and, and understanding agriculture um enabled in order to do precision agriculture but then it also evokes this feeling of farming slow which is you know really a contemplative practice of you know, observing nature and plants don't grow very fast from what I've learned. So I, I love that the title sort of evokes those two contrasting ideas. Um, so yeah, thanks so much for having me. <laughs> Adam will love to hear it. We debated the title quite a bit when we, we started this. Yeah, it's, it's hard to come up with titles and y'all picked a really good one. Um, so yeah, so my introduction to farming and agriculture is really through um, my research as a PhD student in the Department of Geography, and I got involved with my advisor's lab um, back in um, And actually, I'll just show a picture that sort of wraps up where we came from. <laughs> um, so let's see. Are you able works. to share your screen? Uh, let me. Yeah, we tested it out before, and let me get this going. So Microsoft. All right. So I think you all should be able to see this picture. Um, yeah, so my introduction to agriculture was when I interned with Kelly, and this was back when we were working on these devices called the Pulse Pods, which are a predecessor of the Arable Mark. <laughs> it was kind of a, an interesting uh, problem that we had, you know, putting these devices together, you know, it's attached to a tipping bucket that collected all data. And we had this goal of um, placing these throughout Kenya, in our study site in Kenya, to understand um, climate variability at the field scale. Um, and so that was back in 25, 2015, and we've gotten a lot better, obviously, with the terrible mark, which is it's just funny to see those two things together. Um, so my introduction to agriculture was sort of through these devices, and um, I was fortunate enough to get involved in my advisor's National Science Foundation project which looks at um, agricultural decision-making and food security in Kenya and Zambia. And sort of the project is aimed at what kind of science questions you can answer when you couple both real-time environmental data with real-time um, social data about farmers' decision-making. Um, and part of the motivation of that is to do the science, but also kind of become a test pilot to see what kind of decision support systems we could build in the future when we have these two data streams um, coming together. So for folks who might not be familiar, what this looks like, you know, we have an environmental sensor that collects data at the sub daily level, um, has different parameters, rainfall, air temperature, and DVI. Folks might be familiar with those, but then we also have this interesting way of collecting uh, social data, which is through mobile phones. And so we have um, a program it actually concluded now, but it ran for five years in Kenya and Zambia, where we would sign up farmers and, you know, incorporate them into our program where every week before, during, and after the growing season, we would ask them questions about their agricultural management. So it, we asked them questions like, did it rain? Um, did you plant maize this week? What kind of maize did you plant um, in terms of the seed variety? And so that really enables us to capture a picture within the season in real time of what's happening at the field scale. And then we can couple that information with the environmental sensors. Um, and so that project ran from 2015 to 2019. It's a portion of my dissertation thesis. And 
really those experiences enabled me to ask questions that I developed um, for my PhD research. And how many farmers were you reaching out to through these surveys on a seasonal basis? Was there like a weekly outreach or how did it, I mean, how did you put that together in terms of setting up to get the information back that you needed to couple with the environmental data? Yeah, so our numbers were a little different in Kenya and Zambia. Um, and so for in both contexts, we would text them once a week. It was on Saturday at least in Kenya. Um, so then they'd sort of answer questions pertaining to the week before. Mm -hmm. And in Zambia, I think we had over a thousand farmers enrolled. And in Kenya, we had, it was more around 800. Um, and not all 800 farmers would respond at one time. It was sort of hit and miss, you know, depending on what was going on um, with the farmers. But we did um, con compensate farmers for their time. Um, it was really just a reimbursement, like, um, so at the end of the work, uh, we had about 2,000 farmers enrolled in Kenya and Zambia and about 120 censors um, in both those countries. So. And before you started the project, what was the type of data that you were looking at in terms of uh, precipitation amounts for Mount Kenya, um, weather data? Where were the other sources of pulling this data from without installing all the censors? Yeah, so oftentimes we can get gridded products um, that are available. So, you know, you might have rainfall data that comes from um, stations that are publicly available, and then those are, uh, those gridded products are created from those, but they're often poor spatial resolution, like the um, CHIRPS product, if folks are familiar with those, I think it's a five kilometer resolution. And so, you know, when we're installing these devices, it's we're never further away than one or never closer than one kilometer um, for the sensors. So it's like, you know, hyperlocal data. Um, there are other obviously remote sensing imagery you can use um, for data collection as well. But um, for me, I've, I guess I've gotten work because I a lot of time um, in the early part of my graduate experience going out and installing these devices onto farms. Um, in, in Kenya and Zambia, but Kenya is sort of more where my expertise is. So I guess to maybe introduce people to where we work, um, the Mount Kenya region is in central Kenya and Mount Kenya is the second tallest mountain in Africa after Mount Kilimanjaro. And so there's this really interesting heterogeneous landscape, um, you know, where there's smallholder farmers, which are these um, white dots. Those are the households that we work with, as well as commercial agriculture, um, in part related to flower farms. So cut flowers are a big export in Kenya. And then because it's in a mountainous region, you sort of have this interesting rainfall gradient where closer to the foothills of the mountains, far farmers will receive more rainfall. And then as you get into kind of the lowland areas, it gets drier. Um, so there's kind of an interesting rainfall dynamic to play here, which is why it's important to um, have a lot of measurements of rainfall, which are the, these blue dots are the arable marks, um, so that we can sort of see what the heterogeneity of rainfall is. Because um, five kilometer, it's, having graded rainfall that's five kilometers is pretty good, but um, for this region in particular, when it's so heterogeneous, it's good to have like, you know, good in-field measurements. And just, you know, for our own, how you would define smallholder farmers in Kenya between the commercial growers, is it, I know in Zambia, there are larger plot sizes for smallholder farmers, I think up to five hectares. And then mm -hmm. in Kenya, they're much smaller. I think they're between one to two hectares each. Is that about the size that we would see here? Yeah, it sort of depends. I mean, you'll, you'll get farmers with five hectares in Kenya as well. Um, I think the, the main difference for me is that these, you know, large, um, large flower farms, it's almost like they're corporations. <laughs> like they're, they, it's industrial ag, whereas at the household scale, um, you know, you might have a couple people working on the land and uh, maybe there's irrigation, maybe there's not, whereas with the commercial agriculture, there usually is irrigation. So that's, and it's interesting too, you might have a flower farm and then out, right outside the flower farm, there are these smallholder farmers. Um, so they're co-located very much. Got it. And so from this, you were pulling the data, the precipitation data, and the planting data. And I think you have some slides on how that information all comes together. Yeah, for sure. So there's 
kind of two aspects of the work that we can do with these two data streams. So the environmental data and the social data. And one is just to monitor sort of what's happening during the season. And so one of the questions that we ask farmers is, did you plant this week? So we can get, you know, the week that they planted and then also have a sense of whether it rained on their farm. And so here's some distributions of planting and I'll sort of walk um, people through this because it's a lot right at the beginning. So on the left, we have planting dates for two years. 2016 is in red and 2017 is in blue. And so for 2016, um, and there's two cropping seasons, they sort of crop plant between March and May and then later on the, in the year starting in October. And so for 2016, um, you know, we have kind of this normal-ish looking distribution of planting dates and then farmers also planted later on in the year. And in 2017, um, it was a drought year. So farmers planted a little bit earlier. Um, they shifted their planting day earlier to try to catch the rains that did come. Um, and then they didn't plant so much later on in the year. And what we can monitor with this is we not only ask about their planting, but we also, also ask when they harvested. So in 2016, we can see that, you know, folks harvested quite a bit. Um, and they have this long range of harvest dates that might have to do with the different varieties of maize that they planted because some uh, cultivars grow really quickly, perhaps in 90 days, whereas others might take 180 to 210 days to grow. So that's why you have this pretty long distribution um, of weeks that they harvested. And then for 2017, because the end of 2016 and 2017 was a drought year, we don't really get a good response rate for people harvesting, um, which is a result of it, it was a drought year and people were really struggling. Um, and I'll just note that it is important to sort of couple these SMS surveys with other methods of like verifying what's going on with the ground on at the ground because, you know, there could be other reasons why people aren't responding to the SMS surveys. Maybe, you know, they're really busy or they're in crisis. So like responding to our SMS surveys is just not on their agenda, which we can probably identify with now as like also being in a time of crisis. <laughs> um, so yeah, so it, it's neat to sort of see these data streams come in in real time and get, get a sense of what's going on the ground um, for many farmers without actually having to be there. Um, so How that's come sort of, yeah. such a shift between even the planting dates in 2016 and 2017? Is there an ag extension group that goes around and recommends planting times? Or how does, the, how does everyone decide that this is okay, this is the time that we're going to do it this year? Is it signaled, I guess, by the rainfall or something? Yeah, that's a great question and um, one that I've been trying to get at with my research and it's pretty complicated. But in terms of information that's coming to farmers, they do have agricultural extension agents that are responsible for disseminating agricultural advisory. So that might be, you know, this time of the year is going to be the best to plant. You will want to plant this variety, um, you know, and other information. Farmers also get information from the radio, which is in a sense also uh, agricultural extension work. Um, and so yeah, so they, they do have these different sources of information that are coming to them that might help them um, figure out when the best time is to plant. But in my experience, farmers, talking to farmers and also extra agricultural extension agents, um, sometimes there's just a lot of guesswork involved. So like if you don't really have a good sense of when the rains are coming, or if your cues, your environmental cues that you used to use about when to plant, if those no longer work. So um, Traditionally speaking, some farmers, you know, told me that there, used, there would be like the winds would change a certain direction or the certain butterfly would emerge and like now is time to plant. And some of those markers in the environment are changing because of climate variability and climate change. And so there's a lot more guesswork involved. I mean, I think there's always been like a fair amount of guesswork in figuring out when the rains are going to come, but um, now it's like exacerbated. But yeah, but that's the, the job of extension agents and also research programs like ours and NGOs and government services to try to eliminate the guesswork um, for farmers. And yeah, in terms of the, the variability in these planting dates, I think part of what happened in 2017 was just because it was a drought. And so people are really optimistic, like, okay, if there's a little rain, let me plant now because there may not be rain later. Um, but you know, that can become problematic if it really doesn't rain and then you don't have access to irrigation. Um, maize is a thirsty crop, so there's not so much you can do. But uh, that was the research question that I sort of, yeah, was looking into um, for one of my projects. And it's looking at what are the factors that sort of show us what determines a farmer's planting timing. And so how does farmers, uh, rain, how do rainfall at the local level relate to 
a farmer's decision to plant. And so one way that we can model that is using a logistic regression. And so that's when you have an outcome variable that's binary. So in this example, it's uh, just for an analogy, say you spend a certain amount of hours studying and then there's gonna be an outcome as to whether or not you passed an exam. So if you studied for zero to one hours, you're unlikely to pass your exam. So that's an outcome of zero. And if you studied for five hours, then maybe you're gonna pass your exam. And so it's this nice, as curve logistic function to represent that. So I wanted to use this model to sort of talk about if rainfall is related to a farmer's decision to plant. And when we take a look at that um, and model it, what I did was, so same thing, it, the probability of a farmer planting is either a zero, they haven't planted, or one, they have planted. And then on the x-axis, I have the um, total rainfall before a farmer planted. And this is using the arable mark data not this, it's actually some of the older arable mark data. Um, so we had 10 sensors um, throughout the study site at that time. And so then based on the, the rainfall that we're seeing, our farmers planting, um, you know, as rainfall increases. And so what we see is all these dots are farmers who haven't planted and the, these dots up here are farmers who have planted. And you sort of see that um, it's kind of like an interesting and hard to sort out why this is happening, but even at levels of really high rainfall, so say 140 millimeters of rain, people still aren't planting. Whereas when there's less than 20, less than 40 millimeters of rainfall, which is maybe okay, um, then farmers are planting. And we kind of wanted to see a tighter relationship and a relationship that got all the way the, to one. And we didn't see that. So that was the signal to me like, okay, there's more than just the rainfall that farmers are experiencing that's um, affecting their decision to plant. So this is a project I'm still working on. Um, specifically with the Climate Hazard Center at UCSB and sort of looking at some other variables that affect farmers planting. This might be a silly question, but it, does it have to do with them, how, with when they receive bank loans to, to purchase seed or anything like that, or is it more driven by climatic factors? Um, it can be such a mix of things. I've done, Obviously, I've talked to farmers a bit, and then we've also surveyed them on sort of the factors that determine their their planting. And yeah, there are a whole host of social factors that could affect planting timing. Um, one thing could just be if they have a farmer in their community who's sort of a lead, then they're his neighbors or her neighbor. So it's kind of like the social um, social effect. And yeah, certainly access to seed, access to inputs does make a huge difference. So if you're saving up for a certain seed and you don't have it yet, then obviously you're not gonna plant. Um, another one is, you know, if the rainfall is really good on a Sunday, but on Sunday you go to church, then you might not be planting on Sundays. Um, yeah, things like that. And over the five years of, you know, your work in these regions, did you notice uh, a shift in rainfall patterns over the time, like when they would be slightly later or earlier than what would be expected just generally over the period? Yeah, um, there is a lot of both temporal and spatial variability in rainfall at our site. And so, you know, since I started working there 2015 until now, there were a couple drought years and also in 2018, a year of like very heavy rainfall. So let me pull up this slide. Um, so 2018 is actually when I started my Fulbright in Kenya. And it was the same time when we were installing the arable marks on fields. And it was the 2018 March to May rainfall season was the wettest in over 118 years. And so this is around where we live, uh, where I lived at the time, where we work in Kenya. And it was um, just extremely wet. This one is like where it ranks in that 118 year record. Um, and so yeah, it was really challenging and also kind of like for me a good experience because I'd been so used to this narrative of drought then all of a sudden, you know, it was really wet. And that presented a challenge with installing the marks because um, all of a sudden we were trying to install the marks when it was raining and very muddy. And then, you know, the roads we would need to take to get to households to install them would become flooded and almost like rivers that you couldn't cross. So I have sort of some fun pictures of us getting stuck in the mud. <laughs> um, this is our field truck behind here. And, you know, to pass, we had to help this car get out of the mud and this whole process. So, yeah. So, Obviously, this is related to installing the marks. Um, the rainfall was a challenge, but also at the farm level, if you planted your seed and then a high rainfall event occurs and it washes your seed out, then you've not only lost your seed, but also that time and energy that you've put into preparing your land. Um, so that was a real problem. Um, flooding is as much of a problem as drought is, and 
those two events tend to go hand in hand. Um, I also feel like this year we had an issue, and maybe I'm remembering this wrong, where we that the power went out and that it took down the cellular and that this made it harder to get the data from the devices on a regular time stamp. Yeah, for sure. That That's more of an issue in Zambia and Kenya, and um, and I'm happy to talk about it because I was involved in the, the Zambia installs as well. And so in Zambia, um, a large portion, at least where we work, um, their electricity comes from hydroelectric dams. And so if there is a drought, um, the dams won't produce energy. And so, yeah, so that'll cause um, power failures in the area. And so for our devices that require cellular connectivity to transmit the data, that would be a problem um, in, in Zambia specifically. In Kenya, there's a little bit less of an issue with that. Um, it, part of the reason why is that AC, Kenya is on sort of the forefront of ICT development and has pretty good cellular connectivity um, based on a variety of reasons. But yeah, dear, if you're remembering exactly right, it's been a struggle. <laughs> I know, I'm always trying to think, you know, we look a lot at whether satellite could make sense in, in more rural geographies where this data is so important to collect. Um, and so just trying to understand how challenging it was sometimes to have the connectivity in places you were working. Yeah, absolutely. Um, actually, if I could, I have a slide just if people aren't sort of like picturing what's going on. And I know this is an old graphic from Arable, so excuse me if yeah. this is like, you know, <laughs> from a while back, but this is sort of the goal. So we would have, you know, the IoT devices, the Arable marks in the field, um, sensing the environment, and then they communicate to the cell tower that gets pushed to the cloud. And then here, you know, at the farm level or me in California looking at the data, I can download the data and work on it. Yeah, and if you, when you have poor cellular connection, this part, you know, getting the IoTs the arable marks to um, to talk to the cell towers becomes a challenge, and so we have we had sort of some interesting experiences in Zambia where the cellular communication was a struggle, and so we'd always have this requirement for our installations, like the device needs to be <laughs> within a you know viewing of a cell tower, so it, you know there's no obstructions, nothing getting in the way, um, because we really had a challenge there in Kenya. It was you know we could ins install it on a farm, and most of the time we were fine, sort of. My litmus, litmus test for checking if the arable mark was going to work is I have a YouTube video, then that was good enough um, to, to install the device there. And in Kenya, it was really fine, but in Zambia, it was a bit of a struggle. Um, I like and that yeah, test. so <laughs> yeah, I, I think somebody at Arable gave me that idea because I was like, I don't know how to check, um, you know, I'm whether sure it was Taylor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It does sound, it does sound right. So um, this actually spurred kind of a research topic and question for me is, you know, we're installing all of these sensors onto farms and we have these SMS surveys that we're collecting real time um, household level data. But we sort of went on with the assumption that farmers will have mobile phones and also that they can equally participate in our um, SMS program, where in Kenya, they are sort of like on the um, leading edge of this curve in terms of cellular ownership, um, compared to Zambia, at least. And so for me, I had this question like, okay, we're doing the SMS program, but we probably need to learn a little bit more about how farmers are using their mobile phones, um, specifically for their agriculture, and if there are any gaps in terms of usage, you know, either between men and women or different um, groups of users, questions like that. Um, so yeah, so that that was sort of an offshoot of the National Science Foundation project that I found really interested in, sort of made my own research questions out of. Super cool. Yeah. Um, I don't have slides about that. So maybe I'll just talk about it a little bit more without having to like say, share hmm, which slide yeah. works about this? So I'll, I'll stop the share. Um, but yeah, so one thing that we did was that we uh, went out and, and conducted a household survey of our farmers in Kenya. So there's about 600 farmers that live in the Mount Kenya region. And we asked them, you know, do you, it was a whole household survey that took 90 minutes, but there's a module that had to do with ICT use, specifically mobile phone use. And so we asked them questions like, do you own a mobile phone? Um, for what reasons are you using your phone to do your agriculture? Um, do you access any apps or services that 
help you learn about agriculture. So I'll step back and say there's been a lot of initiative and push to provide farmers with information, um, either through apps or text message programs or voice call programs that help them sort of bridge the gap between what they know about farming and what could maybe help them. Um, and I say farming in terms of both livestock and agriculture. And so there's been a lot of um, work within sort of the NGO space and the government space and the private sector um, to get these apps and services out to farmers. But we, what we didn't know before about at least our study site in Kenya is there's all, all this great development of all these apps out there, but our farm is actually using it. So with this household survey, we were sort of able to get that. And um, you know, even though we found that 98% of our farmers do own a mobile phone, not all of them are using these apps and services that are available to them. Um, and part of that gap is due to the fact that farmers usually own kind of what we would think of like a flip phone, the basic phone, it doesn't have a touch screen, it doesn't have a full keyboard. Um, you don't, you can't browse the internet very easily. Um, and there's kind of this issue because the apps and services that are designed sometimes leapfrog straight into the application space where it is really useful and you can do a lot of neat um, kind of user interface stuff within the apps, but these the phone types that are being owned among the smallholder farmers aren't necessarily those phones. So I, we published a study that came out in April that sort of talked about that gap and I think is useful for um, development actors to just be reminded like, hey, maybe don't leave ahead to the smartphone or um, web browser space yet because folks are still using basic phones. And um, so from your research, you would want most of the information conveyed through some sort of SMS and then is there a way, I think you had set it up so that you were covering the costs of all those text messages so that they wouldn't incur them on top mm -hmm. of their monthly plan. So that's yeah. probably another key piece yeah. to designing these types of projects is, is what I'm imagining. Yeah, exactly. So affordability, um, maintenance costs of the phones, those are all important, important things to consider. And yeah, I'm glad that our SMS program was through SMS <laughs> and not some other medium. Um, with the exception of USSD codes, I think that's also appropriate in these landscapes. So USSD, that's when you, on your phone, you type like hash three, four, seven pound or something, and then it pulls up a, you know, a menu and then from there you can select. That's also really easy to use on a, on a basic phone or feature phone as, as they call them. Um, but yes, yeah, yeah, so our program was SMS. We were reimbursing the farmers, um, plus giving them a few extra cents per, Theory. Um, and that was feasible to do because it was part of a National Science Foundation grant and so we had funds to do that but if you're a company that's trying to get your service out there you're either going to try to have the farmers pay for it or have it be free for the farmers in some way that's paid through some other route um, and so that, yeah it's it a little tricky yeah and then after I, I mean from the results of all the work over the five years was there something was there a data delivery that you gave to them about rainfall or about the weather, or the forecast that ultimately altered behavior or what, you know, what did you see as, you know, the most compelling change or way to change behavior through the, through your research? Yeah, that's, that's a great question and sort of something I've had to grapple with because in one sense, the, the National Science Foundation grant isn't meant to be prescriptive, like telling farmers what to do. But on the other hand, we are collecting this really novel, interesting, and potentially useful data set. So one way that we um, communicated the information back is through the agriculture extension agents. So every month I compile um, a spreadsheet of the arable mark data throughout this, our study site in Kenya and, and give it to these agricultural extension agents. Um, and for those that might not be familiar, these ag agents are usually government employees, although sometimes they can be within the private sector, and their role is to disseminate information, give agricultural advisories for farmers on the ground. So they might have anywhere between 1,000, 2,000, 5,000, 20,000 farmers who they're responsible for getting information to. So our rainfall reports were super helpful for them to get a sense of what is happening on the ground, um, especially when these gridded products aren't necessarily represented, gridded rainfall products aren't representative of what's happening um, at the household level. And so, yeah, so these workers, then their jobs is to sort of feed that in rainfall information back. And I think something that I've learned is that there's a huge market and space um, for getting this sort of precision agriculture information to smallholder farmers, but we're kind of at like the beginning stages of it. It's not 
I haven't come across too many programs that are like doing it, you know, the right way and they're reaching lots of farmers. Like it's something, it's a problem that is actively being worked on, um, which I find really exciting. And for me, one of the questions that I continue to think about and probably will try to integrate in my career is how can we um, minimize the amount of guesswork and sort of uncertainty around um, some of the most crucial planting decisions or cropping decisions that a farmer will make. So if we have this long range of planting dates um, during the season, but the rainfall is only going to come during a certain part of that, we really want to try to, you know, tighten up when farmers are planting to maximize their production based on the rainfall. Of course, that changes a little bit when farmers have access to irrigation. So irrigation precision, precision irrigation is another um, avenue that farmers can I'm hoping more investment will be made so that farmers can be able to utilize it. Um, yeah, I was going to ask, that was my next question, is if there was one place that you think would have a major impact, you know, what would it be? Is it road infrastructure? Is it irrigation infrastructure? Um, yeah. I guess I, I have in my mind so many questions related to that. Like, is, is if you have access to irrigation infrastructure, is it expanding the size of smallholder farming and then having them sell some of that to a market? You know, what is, what causes transition and, and what's right? I guess this is more of a, a value-based question than, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, a, a typical interview, but yeah, be interested to hear your, your thoughts on it. Yeah, I mean, it's a great question and I haven't done like a meta-analysis of all the possible management strategies and like which ones are the best for farmers. There are cities that look into that, but based on my experience, I mean, you've kind of hit the main ones. Um, certainly getting road infrastructure, making that better. Um, start, in both places in Zambia, I would say it was like maybe more of an issue, <laughs> at least from my experience, um, where we work in the southern province. Um, although Kenya has its share of problematic roads. Um, that That's always just going to make um, the transition from farmers producing on their farms and getting it to market easier. So, you know, the better we can do with that, um, the more successful farmers will be. Um, yeah, access to water irrigation is also a big one. Um, there are companies that are developing solar powered pumps so that farmers can access groundwater a little bit more easily. Um, another one that's kind of lower tech is building a water pan so farmers can um, kind of dig a hole next to or nearby their plot and then line that with plastic and then when it rains they can harvest water so rainwater harvesting is is a big um sort of potential and let me share a picture of some of the irrigation things that i'm talking about because it's always helpful to see with an image yeah that would be great and water availability from rivers is is pretty good in both regions or is it um were both locations very drought prone? Um, both locations are definitely very drought prone. There's certainly more, you can see this, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, there's more river water from Kenya just because it's at the foothills of Mount Kenya. Um, Zambia's not as, <laughs> doesn't have as much um, river water resources. And so what farmers can do is that they can build these piped um, networks from rivers and then this can be both use both at the household level and then also um, at, on their farm. And then these water pans is sort of what I'm talking about here. You can build or dig a hole, basically a, a little pool um, next to your garden, or your, your, your plot, fill it with, um, line it with plastic and then it gets filled up during the raising season and then you can use it to irrigate your crops. So um, that's sort of an example of that, you know, the more water that you have access to, the more that you can grow crops um, and Part of, I think, the novelty and potential interest in um, the arable mark data is how can we help farmers precisely time their irrigation so that they're maximizing their production. And I guess I'll add anecdotally, I was talking to a, an agriculture extension agent named Jane, and she was, you know, she was all excited that we were going to give her rainfall data and whatnot, but she was like, if you guys could get a soil moisture probes, that would be so helpful. Like, you know, having 12 soil moisture probes in the farms and then we can monitor soil moisture levels to, you know, know exactly when to plant. It's like the dream <laughs> one day, maybe, you know, that, that'll be possible. But there's certainly a, a real desire to measure soil moisture levels um, to help farmers with their management. Yeah, no, super interesting. And then in terms of the crop mix in these photos, is this typical for what you would see on the, this, the farms you would work with? Or is this? Um, yeah, um, there's, there's a whole range of, I'm trying to see if I have a picture of 
all the different crops that are grown, but not so much. I mean, here, <laughs> here we're doing a household survey and you can just see maize for days. <laughs> mm -hmm. So maize is certainly a staple, but um, really, I mean, somebody once told me like, you can grow anything in Kenya. And it really did feel like that. Um, on the farms, you might see potatoes, sweet potatoes, all kinds of leafy greens, kale, um, you know, chard, uh, obviously different fruits like avocados becoming a relatively big export, um, pineapples, mangoes, just all kinds of stuff. Um, so yeah, it's, and it's sort of, a lot of the farmers that I've worked with, you know, they do consume the crops that are pr being produced at the household scale, but then they do, um, you know, sell their production at markets. So they're pretty savvy about which crops are, you know, going to get the highest returns at markets and then eating at the household level, you know, stuff like maize and, and other things that are just, um, you know, things that they consume anyways. Right. And yeah. from that, you know, was there a transition to doing more high value specialty crops or is it still um, predominantly maize production? Um, it's sort of a mix. I, that's I, that question I think gets at um, the value of agricultural cooperatives and different farmer groups. So mm -hmm. farmers can belong to a number of social groups. They might be, you know, part of a banana collective or just in general a farming collective. And through those um, social groups, they find out ways to get their products to market, how to do the farming better. And so the farmers who are sort of connected to these social groups, um, agricultural cooperatives, farmer groups, um, they tend to, I think, have a better, easier time um, sort of making that transition to market. And of course, there, there's also kind of international and um, investment interest in these groups as well, because you might have a group that, you know, you want them to Chia seeds isn't the right example, but some specialty crop that, you know, we consume a lot in the U.S. Well, we can have Kenyan farmers farm it and then ship it here. Um, and that sometimes those specialty products are sort of done through agricultural cooperatives. Got yeah. it. Super interesting. We have a number of questions, uh, Natasha. So I'm just going to read a few of them out so we can start to, to go through them. Mm -hmm. Um, the first is, <laughs> this is a, a tough question. So is there a realistic proposition from a cost perspective on how a high density data collection network could be installed in sub-Saharan Africa? Ooh, yeah, that is a tough question and is something that our project kind of has struggled with because you can have funding for five years and collect all this high density, really wonderful data, but it sort of has an expiration date once the funding ends and so the devices that we have expensive for any one farmer to purchase on their own, for example. So yeah, it's, um, I think the more that government services and NGOs can see the value of this data, then there are, you know, you don't necessarily need to have one device, you know, to cover a small area. You could have fewer um, to cover a greater area. I, I'd say I'm still working on the answer to this question and I would love to, you know, if people have thoughts about it, um, sort of talk with folks because yeah, that is a major issue moving forward. Yep, I can share the contact information after uh, today. Uh, what was the process taken to translate the weather observations into messages for farmers? Was the information specifically about weather or did it go further to then provide information on when to take a specific action? Yeah, that's a great question and is a field of research that is um, definitely active and sort of this question of how do you take something like a weather forecast, which is a percentage, you know, likelihood of rain and then translating that to a farmer where they can actually make a decision. And there's, you know, research that you can do on both ends, like figuring out how to make these forecasts, um, how to make the language around those understandable to farmers, but then also from the farmer's perspective, figure out the information they need so that it can actually be useful. Um, and for our, our project, we don't uh, really delve into that so much. Um, because the data that we're giving back to the farmers mainly through the extension agents. So they're the ones who are sort of translating it and providing farmers with what they need and also the extension agents, you know, so that they can do their job as well. Um, but it, that's a very active field of research and something that I think the like mobile phone space and um, internet space is going to have to grapple with because, for example, you know, I can go on my phone and look at a weather phone camp forecast um, through the browser, but people who, farmers in Kenya, for example, who have a basic phone and the browser function isn't so 
easy to look at a, a website, for example, then you have to be able to translate that information through a text message or a voice call or some other medium. So yeah, that's another great question. I know there's a, these are tough questions. Um, <laughs> I have a question about the impact of fall armyworm on some of the locations um, you had the devices set up and if you know any of the data you provided either provided some insight into that this pest you know what was going to be a problem or you know in, in some way was able to help farmers understand what was happening or how long it was going to be present or if there wasn't data that you had that was effective is there information now being collected that farmers could use to understand the timing of these types of pests and diseases yeah for sure there's there's a lot of work being done in the fall armyworm space and it's a problem that i've seen um on the farms uh, which is always just devastating when you have a pest like that. Um, but some of the work that's being done is using um, like AI and machine learning so that farmers can take a picture of the disease and the disease can be then identified and put as part of a larger database to sort of track and monitor um, pest and disease outbreaks. Um, and so for our research, we didn't really get into that so much, but there is a space, um, you know, through mobile phones, through mobile technologies to help farmers with these sort of issues. Super cool. And mostly you would say for smartphones or something for an SMS based platform? Yeah, in that case, in terms of taking pictures, it would obviously be a smartphone, but then you could have some kind of alert system where, you know, if you had farmers set up in a SMS survey program, or just an SMS program, and somebody who's collecting and analyzing the data, if they know that there's, that there's fall armyworm in a certain area, they might send out alerts to farmers um, via text message that say like, hey, just so you know, there's fall armyworm, take X, Y, and Z measure. Um, that makes yeah. sense. In mm -hmm. your experience, this is a question from the audience, is in your experience, is farmer action more likely the impact of peer group influence or is it his or her interpretation of the tech-based insights? Yeah, it, it really depends. I mean, farmers are individuals. I would say there might be like an age component. So farmers who are elderly or sort of have done things, you know, the same way their whole life, it might be a little bit more difficult to sway them in a certain direction um, based on what they're learning from their peers or what they're hearing from the radio or, or learning from their mobile phone. Um, but there are, you know, younger farmers and I don't want to generalize. I mean, there's certainly like grandmother farmers who are like really innovative and inventive too. Um, but yeah, I'd say in general, people are pretty adaptable and like want to figure out how to do farming better. So they're learning from what's coming on the tech side um, in order to do better. So it's kind of a mix. With that said though, I guess I'll give the example of the planting date. So something I heard a lot from farmers is like, well, we've always planted maize on March 15th or April 15th. So that's, you know, we'll continue doing that because it's what we've always done. And sometimes that can have problems when the rain, you know, comes in late February and you should maybe be planting earlier than April 15th or if it comes later. So um, I certainly heard narratives that like, well, we've always done this the same way, so we'll keep doing it. But I think sometimes people will say that and then their actions will be different. So, you know, in the moment or during the season, they'll be like, actually, everyone's doing it this other way. Maybe I should follow suit with that too. So. Yeah. yeah, it's hard to generalize on yeah people's behavior, so I can understand that. Mm -hmm. Well, Natasha, thank you so much for joining us today. This has been um, one of my favorite episodes because it's something I'm super passionate about, and it's it's so you know interesting to hear your stories and the anecdotes from the field. And yeah, if if folks have questions, is there a way that they can get in touch with you or? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so if you go to my LinkedIn, there's a link to our lab webpage that you can find my email. You can always reach out to me on Twitter. Um, yeah, the email is probably the easiest. So that's n Natasha Krell, my last name at ucsb.edu. Um, um, yeah, and I would love to hear from folks if they have ideas or thoughts or want to continue these conversations. I'm super stoked about that. Thank you so much for joining us today. This. Um, will be on our website tomorrow for folks that missed it and um, or other people that are interested in seeing it. So check back then. Thanks everyone. Thanks. Bye Natasha.